So our final scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, verse 21, uh, verse, chapter 21, verses 14 through 19. And just some context here, because we don't get it in this, in this pericope, the fancy word for scripture selection. In this scripture selection, we don't get the context that before this moment, Jesus has been standing on the side of the Sea of Tiberias, which in John is also where he fed the multitude with the, with the fish and the loaves. And as he's standing there, the disciples who've been fishing all night, and apparently they're really bad fishermen, haven't caught anything. And he calls out to them to drop their nets as they're trying to come into shore and the right side. And they, and they have this amazing catch. And then they come back into shore and Jesus has made breakfast for them, fish and loaves. And that's where we come in this part of the scripture. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. Jesus asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And so he replied, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. And when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we can say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? So many words of Peter echo in our hearts, Lord. We believe, help our unbelief. We love, help us in our faults. Christ, this day as we read and hear your word, help us to follow you. To go where we may not want to go. To love those we might find it difficult to love to feed and care for your sheep as you have commanded. By the Holy Spirit, God, in hearing these words, help us to be the church. Amen. I was really thankful for those of you on Zoom that prominent in the video that gets played before church were pictures of all the stained glass in our church. It might be hard, depending on where you're sitting in the sanctuary, to see the two really beautiful stained glass up here, and then obviously the really beautiful stained glass in the back. And whenever I see stained glass, I'm reminded of my friend Sarah from high school. She was a year older than me, and not only did we attend the same school and took some of the same classes, but we also attended the same church. And I remember her, she was kind of like my older sister. We would spend a lot of time together. And when she turned 18, she got a tattoo her senior year, which sometimes 18-year-olds are wont to do when, when they're allowed to. And the following week at youth group, someone came up to her and made the comment, you shouldn't get tattoos, your body is a temple. And with this wit that is just so true to Sarah and all this seriousness and as quick as possible, as if she had planned it, she responded, my body is a temple. Some temples have stained glass windows. I'm not sure if Sarah won the argument or if the person who had made the comment just wanted to leave her alone, but I thought to myself, I'm going to use that one day when I get a tattoo, and no one has ever given me the chance to use it, which might be a good thing. Some temples have stained glass. The thing is, for many people who have grown up in church or maybe just been in the church and been hurt, Buildings with stained glass, pews, and a pulpit can recall moments of pain and judgment. They represent an institution that feels too perfect for others. I know people who have been hurt by the church enough that even the sight of a stained glass window can cause some anxiety, some fear, that they're in a space that they're not good enough to enter. 
And it's quite upsetting to hear this. First, because someone has been hurt, but second, because I think stained glass is such a beautiful form and medium of art. Perhaps, in a sense, tattoos are the new stained glass. At least that's how Reverend Michael Beck, a Methodist pastor in Florida, put it in his book. In a story for his local news station, he describes how the tattoos that cover his arms are meant to tell the story of how he became the pastor he is today, a journey that started when he had to drop out of high school so that he could sell drugs, and a journey that includes him being rescued by angels in green suits with handcuffs when he finally went to rehab and was able to get better, and when he finally asked God to help him stop using drugs. Now, Pastor Michael leads the very church he was baptized in, the very church that he had to leave because of his struggle with addiction. But that's not all of his ministry in the world. For a time, he was leading worship in a tattoo parlor. And he was leading recovery meetings for those trying to beat addiction. And he was leading worship at the dog park. And this is my personal favorite. At one time, he was leading church in the Moe's Southwest Grill in Ocala, Florida, every Monday for Moe's Monday. The man who doesn't look like a pastor, the man who you don't expect to be a pastor, has been called to share love and graces in all the places that don't look like church. His story, his tattoos, his past, and his compassion are part of this ministry to a people that just might be more comfortable in a tattoo parlor than in a pew. If you were the artist making stained glass for this scene in John 21, what would Peter's face look like? How would you arrange the glass pieces? Would he be frustrated by the incessant questioning of Jesus? Why, Jesus, do you have to keep asking the same question? Would he be confused? I don't understand the question, Jesus. Can you explain why I'm not answering it correctly? Would he be happy and peaceful just to be speaking to Jesus again? Any of these might be understandable ways to read, to interpret this section of scripture. But there's one thing that Peter must be feeling at this lakeside meal. Shame. Or at least maybe he's having to fight back that shame. The last time Peter stood next to an open flame in the Gospel of John like the one that Jesus is cooking the fish on, Peter was denying Jesus three times. He's standing, warming himself by the fire. And so in the same way that he denies Jesus three times, Jesus asks three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, not long before this breakfast, did not have the right answer. Perhaps in your stained glass interpretation of this story, Peter's face is filled with fear, or he's distraught, is Jesus asking me this because I denied him? Do I have a place in this community after I ran away? This is the first time when we get this kind of intense dialogue between Peter and Jesus after the resurrection. But this story is not about what Peter did wrong. And it's not even about Jesus guilting Peter for doing wrong. It was and is about Jesus' call to Peter to a fully devoted life. It is about Peter being reinstated as the head of the church. Jesus asks, do you love me? Not to taunt Peter for his shortcomings, but to invite him into redeemed ministry, to give him every chance to overcome his past mistakes, to remind him again and again that there is a chance and a place for you here. Peter, you will no longer be defined by your shortcomings, but by the love you confess and live because I live. Jesus asks these questions because he's signaling that whatever Peter has in his past, he is something new today by the lake shore, sustained by the grace of Christ like the, the fish and the bread there, the grace of Christ that is always enough and always present to Peter. So now Peter can go courageously to love and serve Jesus. 
And his calling in faithful discipleship doesn't forget or hold against him his betrayal. But instead, Peter is a symbol of the reality of a church that Jesus calls, full of redeemed sinners, full of people that have gotten it wrong, full of people in all their beautiful reality of their redeemed mistakes. The church is not about the place of perfection, the place of people who've never done wrong. It is precisely led by the one who could not say he loved Jesus at the integral moment, but was able to say it again after Jesus rose from the dead. Catholic theologian and author Henry Nouwen called followers of Jesus wounded healers. What he meant was that the shortcomings, the mistakes, the brokenness in our past are brought into our lives of discipleship, not to further guilt us, but to free us to love people of all backgrounds, to love people of all realities, that even to love even the people we'd rather not go to. The Spirit is calling us to the unlikely church throughout the world, not the saints, but also the sinners. There's a pastor in Colorado named Nadia Boltz Weber, and her church is called uh, the Church for Sinners and Saints. And when they say that, they mean we are all saints and we're all sinners at the same time. Henry Nouwen said this about wounded disciples, wounded healer disciples. He said, the great illusion of leadership is to think that a man can be led out of the desert by someone who has never been there. The great illusion of leadership is to think that a man or a person can be led out of the desert by someone who has never been there. Jesus shows through Peter that the church is meant to be led by messy people who've been in the desert, who know the desert, offering other messy people a place of love an arm to reach out and hold them as they come out of the desert. Peter, you may have denied me, but now I know that you love me, Jesus says. Now feed my sheep and go to whichever sheep I send you. Even the sheep that don't love Peter, that want to arrest him like Saul. All of our brokenness is not left behind us or held against us, but it is invited into this redeemed life of Christ so that we might be with those who feel broken in this moment. The irony of the perception, that one I spoke of earlier, of stained glass windows, the one that sees stained glass windows as part of this perfect and lofty and judgmental thing, is that stained glass was initially used to tell the stories of Jesus' love made from fractured and broken pieces of glass that are pulled together. They're meant to illustrate the gospel, all of Jesus' acts of love. I, used to gr- I grew up in a church where you could follow the gospel from creation to revelation in the stained glass. And the reason it was for people who couldn't read, who couldn't open the Bible and see what the story was. They, the pictures were right there with the light shining through for them. And to make stained glass... You can't use a perfect piece of glass, a perfect window pane, but you have to use broken pieces pulled together in solidarity, in unity, in community to make something more meaningful and more beautiful. This is the church Jesus begins in Peter, a collection of broken people and all their histories pulled together in creative love to tell a more wonderful story of redemption and grace. No matter how your past may have broken you, you have a place in this window pane. No matter what questions or denials or doubts may be in your heart, you have a place in this community, and you are exactly the leader Christ is calling to be the church today and forever, to go to all those unlikely churches of the coffee shop, of the quilting guild, or the farmer's gathering or the tattoo parlor, or the bar, and to invite other broken pieces into the stained glass window that tells of the grace and love of Christ. Would you join me in prayer? Christ, who is enough, and whose grace and love far surpass our understandings, we come to you with our own brokenness, We know that you do not hold that against us, but you hold that in love and redemption to invite us to be people with one another, humans with one another, fallible and grace-needing and lovely 
and wonderful. Give us grace for ourselves, Lord, so that with the measure of grace that we know you give us, we can share that grace with others to know that you are pulling all of us together into something more wondrous than we can imagine. Amen. And so it was at his final meal with his 12 disciples, with the one who would betray him, the one who, did, who would deny him, and the other 10 who just went missing after he had died. It was in this space that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it and he said to them, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And at the end of the supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, you do so in remembrance of me. And in this meal, Jesus did command after he had washed the feet of these betrayers and deniers and deserters. He said, go and do likewise. Because he knew that whatever was ahead of them would be overcome by the love and grace of his resurrection. That he needed these broken and faulty people to go into the world to embrace other broken and faulty people. Because this is the body of Christ. Just as the body of Christ that Jesus shares with us in this meal, we are the body of Christ to be shared with a world in need of grace, of love. So would you join me in praying? Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered he, not here, and on these gifts of bread and juice, and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.